So when I found out I was going to be delivering a sermon here at Chautauqua, I was thrilled. And when I discovered Chautauqua has a different theme each week, I was even more excited. What would I get to preach about? My excitement grew as I looked over the previous week's themes. Spirituality, morality, happiness, social justice, all great, juicy, emotional buzzwords that those of us who minister get really excited about. So what's this week's theme? Diplomacy. <laughs> My first thought was, run. <laughs> After all, if diplomacy is the practice of negotiations between nations without arousing hostility, then shouldn't we just leave that to politicians to talk about? I wanted to talk with you this morning about rainbows and love, maybe kittens. <laughs> But listen, upon reflection, I found that if, as I believe, the purpose of gathering together in religious community is to cultivate our better selves, there's a lot that people like us can do in addressing diplomacy. But it's going to take a bit of a journey to get, where, get to what we can do. And that journey starts with a story. It's a hot morning in May. Shopkeepers have opened their stores, children are ambling to school, the smell of food wafts through the streets of this small town. A goat nibbles on fruit at a market stall as a woman named Lowell looks on. Boom. The ground vibrates with the sound of this explosion and voices immediately rise in distress. Where is it? What's going on? Lowell joins the new townspeople running through the dusty streets toward that deafening sound. She must find her 18-year-old son, Munir. Lowell cannot read, and she doesn't own a television, but Munir, Munir always knows what's going on. When a pile of rubble comes into view, a man drops to his knees saying, Praise Allah, only one house this time. He gestures toward the untouched buildings that surround this rubble pile that had once been a house, a house destroyed by a drone strike. The townspeople sit through the rubble, calling out, is anyone there? There is no response. Hands grip Lau's shoulders, and she turns. It is Munir. Go home, he says gently. Too many people are here. I will help them lift the heavy pieces. Gratitude washes over Lao. Munir lives. She presses her hands to his cheeks. He nods, and then she begins the walk toward home. As she is just steps away, there is another deafening boom. It is a second missile, and in an instant, 24 people lie dead or dying. Lao knows immediately that Munir is amongst them. Lal says now that without Munir, she is blind. He was her eyes. She believes that Al-Qaeda is very bad, but her dreams are not haunted by it. Her dreams are haunted by American missiles. She knows nothing about American politics or people. All she knows is that her son is dead and they are responsible. They are criminals, she says, criminals who stole her son. I tell you this story from a town called Ja'ar in South Yemen, not to make a political point. This is simply one story going on in the world today, one tiny story about one person's loss. But it's a loss that we, even if it's the result of our best efforts in diplomacy, need to recognize. Because it, even if we as a country continue to support our politicians as they make decisions, negotiations, and relationships that lead to this kind of loss, we can't look the other way. We need to feel it. And that's it for me, the core of diplomacy, empathy. True diplomacy is about letting in the consequences, good and bad, of how we interact with others, or how they view us through their religious and cultural lenses, so that we understand the results of our actions in all their complexity. It's about allowing ourselves to feel 
the pain of others far away from us because it's that empathy that informs ethical decisions. But listen, there's one huge problem with this. We human beings have a finite capacity for empathy. It's true. There's only so much we can feel before we start to shut down. Now, you may have allowed yourself to feel that story I just told you, but what if I now told you more painful stories, one right after the other? There would quickly come a point where we all would grow numb to those stories, stories like that one from Jar. You know, it's funny, as I read about Jar, which is spelled J-A-A-R, I kept seeing it as the word Jar. Now, at first I tried to put it out of my mind, but I kept feeling like I was being nudged toward something, however tenuous that connection at first seemed. And in this case, the similarity between the town Jar and the word Jar kept pushing me toward the story of my great-grandmother. Now, back when I was a kid, my great-grandmother's 90-something-year-old eyes spoke of many things, including sorrow. It's the sorrow of my great-grandmother's eyes I see in my mind when I think about Lal. Grandma's eyes were filled with the images of a lifetime, too. Riding side saddle to a one-room schoolhouse in Kentucky, saying goodbye to friends in World War I, watching her son go away to fight in World War II, <laughs> losing her husband during the turmoil of the Vietnam War, and watching both her adult children succumb to cancer. Through it all, Grandma maintained a mystifying, steadfast courage. During the Great Depression, for instance, this is one of my favorite stories about her, she worked in a department store that refused to employ married women, can you imagine? So she was forced to secretly marry my great-grandfather. When she became pregnant, she was so fearful of losing her job that she hid the pregnancy under her work smock. And then she went home Friday from a regular work week gave birth to my grandmother on Saturday, and was back to work Monday morning as though nothing had happened. This was one tough lady. Now, when I knew her, she lived in an apartment filled with the mementos of a lifetime. In her bedroom, there was an old mahogany vanity topped with perfume bottles and framed family pictures, and an old mason jar with a scratched lid. It looked a lot like this jar, only bigger. I had to travel with this one, so I couldn't get it as big as I wanted. Now, this one had some, this one here has got some slips of paper in it, but Grandma's jar was filled with peanuts. I asked her about those peanuts one day. How come you never eat them? They're not there for eating, she said. They're there for looking at. I asked her why she want to look at a jar of peanuts. Well, she said, Sometimes I get worried about the state of the world, but I sure do like President Jimmy Carter a whole lot. <laughs> and Jimmy Carter likes peanuts, so I put those peanuts in my hope jar. What's a hope jar? I asked. Now, Grandma wasn't one for being sentimental, so she looked embarrassed and cleared her throat. Well, a hope jar is a place you put something that gives you hope when things are rough. So when things are bad, I look at those peanuts, and it makes me feel better. That idea of a hope jar, it stayed with me my whole life. And here was my great-grandmother, who had lost loved ones in war after war, who had survived cancer three times herself, only to lose both children to it, and she found hope in a jar of peanuts. What could be more simply profound than that. Now, of course, I've realized since then we don't need an actual jar to have a hope jar. Our hearts and minds can be our hope jar, filled with the things in life that remind us of why life is worth living when things are bad. So what does this have to do with empathy? Well, in order to let ourselves feel the complexity of the world's pain, we have to have a foundation of intentionally cultivated hope so our hearts will grow both stronger and more vulnerable. 
This increased capacity for empathy becomes our ethical foundation as we wrestle with the complicated relationships we maintain with the world. Now you're saying, but Jason, then the question becomes, what on earth do we put in our hope jars? Now, there may still be a few diehard Jimmy Carter fans around, so peanuts might work for you. But for the rest of us, finding evidence of hope can be more challenging. So I put a few ideas about hope in this hope jar to give you some ideas of what you can fill yours with. So here goes. Some of you probably thought this was a tip jar when you first saw it. <laughs> All right. Hope cherishes no illusions, nor does it yield to cynicism. This is a great place to start, since one of the biggest myths in the world today is that it's a rotten place. And sure, there's a lot wrong with the world, like we saw with Lao in Jar. But there's another way that we can look at the world. In Steven Pinker's massive book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Pinker demonstrates that violence has declined significantly over the last few thousand years. Now, even more importantly, whether you look at war, murder, torture, or just about any other indicator of violence, the present, right now, the time we all live in, is the most peaceful time in all of human history, right now. Several reasons for this decline in violence point to empathy, including the increasing respect for a variety of voices like those of women and other marginalized groups, the growing emphasis on reason, which has helped people recognize that privileging one's own interests over others is often destructive, and the rise of literacy and media, which has acquainted people with increasingly diverse perspectives, widening their circles of empathy. So recognizing the strides the human race has made away from violence is an example of dealing in reality without cynicism. We don't need illusions either. Hope finds beauty in the truth of the world we live in. And there's a lot of beauty here, folks. We just have to look around. We can just look around right now and see it. So what do we have next? Hope opens doors where despair closes them. Hope is specific and regards problems as opportunities. So we've already established that the world is a better place than it's often given credit for. But that's not to say there aren't real problems out there. In rural India, for instance, there's been a problem with the availability of immunizations for children. So some well-meaning people set up clinics offering free vaccinations. What could go wrong? Well, for starters, nobody came. Now imagine yourselves in the shoes of a rural Indian mother, a mother whose eyes flicker with that steady strength found in the eyes of my great-grandmother. You've heard about this immunization thing, but you don't really understand it, and you don't have a practical way of finding out more about it. There's work to be done every day, meals to be cooked, and to take precious time to trudge a few miles away to this clinic where your child will cry as she's stuck with a needle seems like an annoying waste of time. Don't push it, critics said. It'll take a few generations for the culture to shift. But the organizers of these clinics didn't give up. They came up with a plan. They'd offer a two pound bag of lentils for each child that was brought for vaccination. Here's what happened. Suddenly there's a line of people waiting to get vaccinated. And as they went home to their villages carrying their lentils, other villagers felt encouraged to do the same. And a dire situation is turned around all because of some inexpensive bags of beans. Now, some critics call those lentils bribes, but I contend they represent hope for the people getting their children immunized. Those lentils are tangible reminders of the nourishment of the body. And what a valuable association that is for people who don't have access to comprehensive vaccination information, but do understand the practicalities 
of feeding a family. I contend those lentils represent hope for us, too. We find hope in the specificity of the solution, hope in lentils. We see that the supposedly insurmountable problem, a problem that requires significant cultural and behavioral shifts, can be viewed as an opportunity. An opportunity to think outside the box, an opportunity to be practical amidst the voices of naysayers, an opportunity to have hope when others are overwhelmed. And the solution, the solution is as simple and specific as a bag of lentils. It could have been a jar of peanuts, like it was for my great-grandmother. Hope isn't found in lofty abstracts. Hope is found in the specific. So what else is in the jar here? Hope looks for the good in people instead of harping on the worst in them. Hope comes from unexpected people and places. I think um, back to last summer when I worked as a chaplain at a large hospital, going from room to room offering comfort where I could and I'll never forget room 1503. Now it was almost lunchtime and my stomach was growling, but I figured I could quickly check on one more room and then go to lunch after all most of my patients that morning had been napping. But 78-year-old Ruth was not napping. She was sitting up in bed, the pink scarf at her neck contrasting with the drab hospital gown. Smiling, she gripped my hands in hers. I've seen you around and knew you were a chaplain, she said. You sure are the bright light I needed, honey. Ruth told me the doctor had said she didn't have much time left. We talked for a while about her kids and grandkids, about the husband who had died a few years before, about the garden where she raised tomatoes, and about queers. <laughs> it's the end of days, honey, she told me. Satan is at work in the world. Queers all around actually getting married to each other and then adopting those poor kids who have to share in their demonic lives. She shook her head and clucked her tongue while I sat there speechless. <laughs> Let me tell you, I really wish I had just gone to lunch. <laughs> What was I, a gay man, to say? As a chaplain, I was supposed to explore spiritual concerns and offer comfort. How could I do that here, when this woman believed in virtually everything I didn't and would likely despise me were she to know more about me? I'll admit that I was tempted to harp in my own mind on what I saw as the worst in her, but Wiser people than me have taught me that our best opportunity for changing minds is by changing hearts, and that has to do with taking time to understand even those, especially those people whose goodness may be hard for us to see. So there, in that hospital room, I recognized that, like it or not, I was called to love this woman and offer her hope Hope that she, unknown to her, was getting from an unexpected place that came in. <laughs> so I stayed and talked with her. It wasn't easy to let go of her previous words, but it was quickly evident that there were areas where I could relate, like the love she felt for her family or the fear she felt as she faced the reality of her failing body. And in her eyes, I saw the vulnerability I had occasionally glimpsed in the eyes of my great-grandmother. When I left, Ruth told me again what a bright light I was. Surprisingly, she ended up being a light for me, lighting the way toward looking beyond the bad to the good in others and appreciating those unexpected wellsprings of hope. Through this unlikely loving encounter between two mismatched people, we both found hope. So we have a couple more things in our jar here. 
You know, if you're beginning to suspect this jar is rigged, you'd be right. <laughs> Hope draws its power from a deep trust in God, nature, and or the basic goodness of humankind. Unitarian Universalists have come from hope-filled traditions. Universalism said that despite our flaws, all humanity, all humanity was worthy of salvation, of being reconciled with divine love. And Unitarianism didn't focus on the death of Jesus. It was Jesus' life that mattered, what his life taught us, how we can become better, more loving people. And as humanism came into our movement, it recognized the power in human potential, our ability to act right here on earth and make it a better place. Today we acknowledge that we're all worthy of earthly salvation, of better lives, of, of growing to be our best selves. We trust in the idea that we're all created worthy of respect and love, and in this sacred trust, we find the hope that is the source of all other hope. But we still have one slip of paper left. What could it be? <laughs> oh, we have this. Hope discovers what can be done instead of grumbling about what can't be done. Well, I've never done that, have you? <laughs> That's right, we people of rationality and liberal faith believe life is more than just survival. So it's not enough to simply remain drowning in grief in tough times. When we hear stories like that of Wal and her son Munir, it can be tempting for us to switch off and numb ourselves to what's going on out there in the world. But if we have our hope jars, Filled to the brim, we'll have enough hope, not just for ourselves, but for others. In our jars will be the knowledge that the world we live in now, for all its wounds, is the most peaceful it has ever been, and that there are those who help others when terrible events occur. We'll recognize that little things like bags of lentils, jars of peanuts, can be inspiration and even solutions in complex situations. We'll find hope in unlikely human connections, like a moment of unexpected grace between a frightened woman and a gay man. And we'll fill our jars with images of children and grandchildren, spouses and friends, those, those people that keep us going. When we have this foundation of hope, we'll be better equipped to empathize with those who appear drastically different from us and will act out of that empathy, demanding from our government behaviors and policies that are ethical, that are geared toward peace, that embrace the full complexity of the spectrum of people's lives, for that, that is what true diplomacy is about. And I've got news for you too. This is our great work, folks. This is why we're here, to recognize our inextricable connection to each other, that we are one in spirit. I know this because I have seen the sorrow of my great-grandmother in Laul and Jahar, the strength of my great-grandmother in the Indian woman taking her child to the vaccination clinic, and the vulnerability of my great-grandmother in Ruth in that hospital room. She is in all those people, just as I am, just as you are. We are all one, and we must learn to act accordingly. It's a big task, but I have hope. I have hope that we can continue to improve our relations with each other, to reshape the world into a place where no one ever walks alone. I have hope, because my grandma taught me to fill my hope jar. And so my question to you is this, what will you put in your hope jar? This moment of connection and community in this place 
of magical beauty would be a great start. This is yours to take with you. And beyond that, the sky's the limit, guys. Our hope jars should be as wide and as big as our hearts and our minds can make them. Our hope jars should be as vast and colorful as the rainbow with the jar's bottom just as elusive as the end of that rainbow. Thanks, Grandma, for sharing your hope jar with us. We promise that our hope jars and their contents will never stop growing, and neither will our hearts. <laughs>